Welcome to the Sicilian Secret Diet Podcast. We're excited today to have a special guest. Dr. Stephen DeVries, and he is a uh, very dear to my heart in what he does. You know, I'm a preventive cardiologist, and he is a very well-known preventive cardiologist and is the executive director of the Gaples Institute, which is a very interesting institute. It's an educational nonprofit with the mission of advancing the role of nutrition and lifestyle medicine and lifestyle in medicine. And he, he has developed a nutritional course at the Institute, and it's now a required nutritional course in six medical schools, which is pretty amazing. And it is amazing because medical schools really did not have much of training in nutrition at all. Yeah, and we'll talk about this when, in, our, in our talk with Dr. Reese. It's very it's fascinating. He's also an adjunct professor of uh, nutrition at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health, where he teaches a course on uh, integrating nutrition into clinical medicine. And he's also, um, his work has been uh, shown on uh, PBS and, and on uh, National Public Radio. He's extremely well known, recently interviewed uh, Dr. Andrew Weil, and uh, so he's uh, he's near and dear to what we do. We love to incorporate nutrition and lifestyle medicine in our practices. Well, Stephen, we're super excited. You know, you I'm a preventive cardiologist, so there's not a lot of us around, and I uh, uh, enjoy speaking to all uh, the preventive cardiologists I know, but we would love to know you know, what led you to get into this area of medicine? Because not, a, again, not a lot of cardiologists that I know of practice preventive cardiology. You know, cardiology is such a vast and intense oh, uh, specialty that, uh, you know, there's a lot of very, very smart cardiologists out there. A, a good friend of mine, extremely well-trained, Columbia, he knows all the data about all the studies for cardiology being in or zero about nutrition. So I would love to know, learn, you know, your, you know, your background, how you got into this and, and what you what you do. Well, yeah, I would first, uh, as a preface to say that your friend who um, reported knowing nothing about nutrition, sadly, that is the state of the art and that is what we're hoping to change. There's a, a huge opportunity there. And uh, he's not alone, but we are we are working to make that uh, a, a relic of the past. But uh, my own interest uh, in prevention, well, interesting, you know, I was probably unlike many people who go into cardiology, the procedural aspect of it was never the big appeal. I was really interested in the function of the heart and how, you know, as an intern and resident, you know, very quickly with diuretics, we could get patients feeling better and and how great that felt to make such a difference. Um, and then, you know, interestingly, so as a trainee, I was trained in all the aspects of cardiology, including cath. But uh, going into practice uh, in an academic setting, I was uh, in the beginning at University of Illinois. I remember beginning to see people as an attending. And in those days, you might recall that caths were done uh, with, uh, with film. It was actually a physical right. film. I remember that well. <laughs> yes, that was the fellow. The fellow's job was to you run that machine. <laughs> the film exactly machine, exactly right. It was like the, uh, the 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 film machine, kind of your own movie projector. <laughs> so it became really clear that you know early on we were really adept at getting people uh, out of very critical situations, and when people came in in the throes of a of a heart attack, you know, we were usually very successful in getting them, uh, you know, recovered and, and better. But what I also noticed is that those people would typically come back time and time and time again. And so those cans that held each of their cast films, I was amazed there was a closet and there were people who had two, three, four, six, ten of these films with their name on it. And obvious proof that whatever we were doing was temporizing, but it wasn't really addressing the underlying problem. So that actually a light bulb went off in my head saying that we've, we've got to be doing something different. This isn't this doesn't make sense to just patch them up, send them out like they were uh, otherwise and, and have them come back again. So I got to be interested in the preventive part. And back then, the cholesterol-lowering drugs were 
were just uh, recently released and everyone thought, you know, wow, if those go into drinking water, you know, we're going to obliterate heart disease, it's going to be gone. And so uh, I was in charge of the outpatient cardiology. I was a director at University of Illinois. And we, we said, we're going to have this cholesterol lowering program. And we did, we had a, a really robust program that, that got, you know, all the appropriate people on meds. And guess what? <laughs> we certainly helped people and fewer people came in, but it did not completely uh, uh, reverse the, um, the circular uh, revolving door that many of the patients went through. So still that, that seemed like it made a difference, but not enough. So then I, uh, I had the opportunity to write uh, a column. It was called Heartbeat for one of the Chicago papers. And uh, patients would, or people would write in their cardiology questions. And uh, many of them related to eating. What should I eat? And is this a good idea or bad idea? And I had to do research to really uh, understand the question and give a good answer because in my training, which was a great place, the University of Michigan and Washu and St. Louis, really top training programs, but I learned nothing about nutrition. So I had to go and really research this. And then I saw, even back then, and this was 20 years ago, saw that there was uh, a really deep literature, even at the time, about the role of diet and food and how it connected to heart health. But none of that was literature that I had received in my training. So it got me to thinking there's another dimension to this that that I just wasn't uh, educated about, even in these great training programs. So some more reading led to more, and I ended up doing a variety of things. I did the Integrated Medicine Fellowship at the U University of Arizona, and that enhanced my nutrition education. But I that was that was uh, really important. But I ended up doing you know much more reading, conference going, and it actually then became the focus of my cardiology career instead of just a, a part of it. Uh, it became the focus. How we could, you know, not completely rely on nutrition lifestyle, but how we could maximize the benefit of nutrition and lifestyle, and then you know, add on the medications and procedures as needed. Because the last thing that I felt then and still feel is that we don't want to, you know, throw out the value of these incredibly potent procedures, but we want to maximize the things that uh, nutrition and lifestyle can deliver because they not only will help heart disease, but they will, you know, have so many positive side effects. So that became the focus of my career, how to balance nutrition with everything that conventional cardiology offers. And then several years ago, I had the opportunity to take that to a very different level and the opportunity to uh, uh, co-found and direct uh, the nonprofit Gables Institute. And our mission is to do exactly what we just talked about, to advance the role of nutrition and lifestyle in medicine. And that is what we are actively engaged, and I am happy to say, uh, making great progress in doing. That's great. So what are you doing with this program? What are you providing with this program? Yes. So the what I realized early on, as I mentioned, that I myself had received no training in nutrition in my my formal training program, is that looking around, there were very, very few opportunities to receive that nutrition training. And what opportunities there were, I thought were lacking in some key ways. So the the goal of our nonprofit is twofold. We've got two target audiences. One is health professionals and one is the public. For the health professional side, we developed um, a condensed interactive nutrition course for health professionals, and we sought to address two areas that I thought were, were really important. One is to make it as unbiased as possible. We really didn't want to start out with the idea that we wanted to promote one type of diet and then find the evidence to support that and go with that. Uh, we really wanted to make it the best representation of, of the best evidence that existed and present material in proportion to the strength of the evidence. So that was one thing we did. And the second, we wanted to make it engaging and fun. So instead of lists and, and a lot of text just put on a computer screen, we wanted to make it engaging and interesting. So that's uh, one, one uh, of our mainstay projects. And we've been uh, actually offering that course 
uh, now it's it's been seven years. We updated every single year because there's new information. So, um, you know, we're really, unlike most continuing education, we make sure that every year we change it. We only seek accreditation for one year. It's accredited for physicians and nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, and even um, registered dietitians. Um, we want to make sure it's relevant. And we want to make sure that it is uh, it's actionable. So we want to make it, we include a section on, you know, physicians are busy. So even if you're knowledgeable about nutrition, how do you find time in a busy schedule to make it work? So we really put in some I- ideas about how to how to make that happen, rapid dietary assessments. We talk about motivational interviewing and so forth. And I'm very, very pleased to say that this course is used by practicing physicians. Um, I would say about half the use is, is practicing physicians. But one of our greatest accomplishments, actually what I am most proud about, is that the Gables Institute Nutrition course is now required in seven medical schools. Oh, so it's not elective, okay. but required. And it includes a, a variety of schools, including Hopkins, Tufts, University of Buffalo, Uniform Services University, there, there's many. Uh, and we are we are really proud. So this is something, there are many schools that offer nutrition electives, but we are really interested in making nutrition not considered an elective, as you know, not optional, not something you can take if you're interested in, but something that is fundamental to learning how to be a doctor and the practice of medicine. And that's um, something that we're really proud about. Uh, so with the Gables Institute, that's the, the physician side. For the public side, we also uh, offer free material that is actually an accompaniment that physicians can refer their patients to. But you can go to our site and even get it without a referral. There's no email required, completely free. The public-facing material is free and uh, available in Spanish and English. So that's been a big project. We are a nonprofit. Uh, we do charge a small amount for the health professional course, but we do not seek or accept any corporate support for that. So we're really proud about that. And the public information is completely free. Well, that's great. And, and it's offered both at your institute and at the AMA too, right? Well, the AMA... Uh, uh, actually uh, has some material about it. And when you look at the material, it refers you to to our nonprofit site. But yes, the AMA has been uh, publicizing our nutrition course since 2017. So I'm really proud. We were, oh, um, to my understanding, the first nonprofit that they were involved with in, in terms of uh, um, advertising the, the course. And we it's it's been a a really wonderful offering. I'm really pleased that the AMA has seen the importance of getting the word out about nutrition, lifestyle, and uh, they, they've been really great in that People regard. You know what AMA stands for? <clears throat> yes, the American Medical, Medical Association. Association. Right. Yes, exactly. It's important for people to, to understand that it's supported by the American Medical Association. So great accomplishments. So thank so, you. One of the questions, oh, th- to go back to my friend who's uh a very well-trained cardiologist, and he sees, with a nurse practitioner, 90 patients a day. And he's wow. extremely busy, obviously, and uh, and I, I've talked to him about nutrition, because I'm very interested in nutrition, right. and I use that with my patient. I, I asked him if he discusses nutrition with his patient. He says he tells every single one of his patients to Google Mediterranean diet. That's what he tells them. That's his nutritional... That's so. Great. How does a busy cardiologist get, I mean, that obviously that's not good enough, you know, that kind of interaction with the patient. So how does a busy cardiologist get this very, very fundamentally important information to his patients? You know, what, what you know, the communication, you know, besides training the, the doctor, do you also train them how to communicate this information to the patients? Absolutely. It's a really great point. And, and actually our, um, nutrition course is divided into four sections. The fourth section focuses exactly on that topic. Like, you know, to have a, a lot of convincing data about the importance of nutrition and and how nutrition can be helpful for both prevention and treatment, that's really critical. But the next part is how do you, like you said, how do you make use of that information, especially for very busy Physicians, maybe not all, maybe are perhaps as busy as, as your friend who sees ninety patients, but but everyone is busy and everyone is 
up to their eyeballs in, in, in work and try to figure out how to make work. So what, what are some strategies that we advocate that can be implemented even in today's, um, today's structure of, of clinic visits? Well, the first thing that I think is really critical that only takes 30 seconds or, or so of a, of a physician's time is to make sure that physicians transmit this message. It can be with these words or some similar to say that, you know, taking the medication I prescribed is is really important for, for you. But don't ever think that medication alone will be sufficient to give you the optimal health that you're capable of having. That it is going to relate to nutrition and lifestyle added to your medicine. So if physicians could convincingly say that, at least it would provide the motivation to patients to think that, wow, taking these pills isn't enough. Because my my feeling is that if a patient leaves an exam room or a hospital room and they're told to take, you know, medicine X, Y, and Z, and they need to to adhere to this program of medicine, but they're not told anything about uh, nutrition or lifestyle, what conclusion can they draw other than I guess it doesn't matter. All I have to do is take the right pills and I'm going to be just fine. And I think patients come away with that with that uh, impression for good reason because that's that's the message that is transmitted in the visit even by the absence of discussion of nutrition because physicians are emphasizing the importance of the medicine if they if they skip their statin and the physician's aware, the physician's going to be like, you know, you really need to take this. If they stop their their uh, anticoagulation or their their uh, you know any of their antiplatelet agents, you know, the cardiologist's going to be jumping up and down about how it's really important. And all of that is is great. I I don't take issue with that, but I do take issue with that. So so one the thirty second uh, idea is just to transmit that medication alone isn't enough. Nutrition lifestyle are critical. That's mission number one. The second level that you could go to that would take you know another 30 seconds to a minute is if there was a rapid dietary assessment done while the patient is waiting, perhaps in the, the waiting room, that the, the cardiologist or physician or you know a, a, any nurse practitioner um, or the PA could pick one of the items from those rapid dietary assessment and discuss that with the patient, you know, through motivational interviewing. Say, so here I see that you drink, you know, three cans of soda a day. You know, would you like me to talk to you about, you know, some of the risks of that? You know, what what are the consequences of that? Is that something you're interested in changing? You know, could we work on a plan together to substitute, you know, water for that or to switch to something intermediate maybe and then eventually to water? Um, but something like that, you know, to pick one action item, that could be done. The third, the third uh, idea that that also is very brief would be to refer to say that nutrition, you know, is is critical for your long term health. I'd like to refer you to, you know, whoever uh, is in your community and practice who you feel would be a, a good diet and nutrition uh, professional. So all those things could happen. But you know, let me share one bit of information that's kind of interesting. Uh, we did a study, actually, a, a survey of physicians from the American College of Cardiology. We surveyed them with regards to how much nutrition, continuing education they took, and their likelihood to refer to dietitians. And what we found was cardiologists who took even a single uh, continuing medical education program related to nutrition were almost twice as likely to refer patients to dietitians as a cardiologist who didn't take any uh, nutrition CME. Right. So it, it does make sense that the more physicians know about nutrition, the better they are to, to recognize opportunities to even have a brief conversation or to make a referral. And the other thing I would say is that if they do recognize the uh, importance of nutrition, they can refer them to resources. As I mentioned, our nonprofit uh, has a, a completely free nutrition learning program. It's interactive, it's graphic, it's fun, and it's available in English and Spanish. So even if they make the the priority message and say, you know, I'd love you to, to review this material and I'm, you know, I'd love to hear, you know, what you learned when you come back and see me in three months or whatever. And then the, the physician couldn't make note, refer them to this 
uh, you know, invited them to discuss it next visit. And then if you circle back, which then would emphasize that this isn't just a one and done, this is a continuing conversation, you can do that. And it doesn't take a lot of time. That doesn't and the take patients can access this and it's free for the patients? Completely free, not even an email required. It's like we make it accessible as a service because- So this is a, this is a national thing. Everyone in the country can- Everyone, the public facing material is completely so we'll, free. We'll definitely put a link to this for our patients because our patients- right. Very good. Now, I wanted to go back and for a moment to what you mentioned, the motivational interview. And I wanted to explain to our audience and to our patients what a motivational interview is. And, you know, I, you know, I'm a psychiatrist, so I do a lot of motivational interviews too. So do you have a couple of minutes to explain? This is very different. A motivational interview is very different from what we normally have been trained to do, right? There is more, yes. we tend to tell people what to do, right? And that we have realized that doesn't work as well. Exactly. Yes. The motivational interview take, takes the moment to, to ask the patient, are you interested in this? And how can I help you with? And that creates a much better, less antagonistic, less... Uh, patronizing way of interacting with a patient. Exactly. That that's exactly right. And, you know, before getting into the, you know, more details of what it is, you know, exactly as you said, the 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 reason why it's so important is that, you know, exactly as you described, the the more conventional approach, you know, I, I think that that is natural to a lot of health professionals when they are thinking to um, uh, have their patients, you know, adopt a healthier lifestyle, is to to give some form of what what really amounts to a lecture. You know, like you really need to be cutting down. You really need to do this. You need to do that. You know, you're to this, and this has to happen. You need to do that. Well, no one responds well to that. You know, no one no one likes to be told what they have to do. What what does work best the evidence shows and what just intuitively feels better is is a conversation with the patient where you know as a as a physician or health professional you do have some knowledge that the patient doesn't have so there is there is that so you can be a resource but there's a difference between being a resource and being you know uh, being a, a finger wagger you know lecture and 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 dictators so that you know when they talk about patients not being compliant with the diet it sounds you know like they've been ordered to do it patients aren't ordered to do anything they 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 should you know do what 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 feels right and hopefully though with the guidance of a trusted health professional they can be guided in a direction that will lead to a better outcome than they could achieve on their own i mean that's the whole goal but it's got to be a partnership so motivational interviewing seeks to maximally elicit um, interest from the patient and to take their own their own inclinations and help guide them their own inclinations toward a path that that they feel um, is the right one for them so that's why i mentioned in the discussion before you know to talk about like someone is drinking you know three cans of soda a day we know that's not a health a uh, healthy move, but you know, instead of saying, you know, you got to stop that, that's terrible for your health. You know, it's true, it is terrible for your health, but it's probably not an effective communication style. So if you can say, well, you know, um, uh, I'm, I see that you're drinking three cans of soda a day. You know, would you like to know more about, uh, you know, the concerns that that have been uh, that have arose about about drinking that am amount of soda? And if the patient goes, no, not really, I couldn't care less. Well, I guess that you say, well, you know, I, I, you know, I, I maybe we can come back to it another time, but it's something that I, I could share with you some information when you're ready. But usually the patient will go, sure, yeah, tell me about it. And they'd say, they would, you know, you can talk about, you know, what you know of the science of it. And then the example would be, well, you know, is that something that you're interested in changing? You know, uh, one, one interesting uh, kind of question that could be asked is, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how interested are you at changing, you know, at, at, at reducing your intake of sugar, sweet, and beverage? Maybe 10 is extremely interested 
and you know one is not interested at all so you know even if the patient goes well three and you know you might think well wow or they're, they're not very interested in that topic well you could you know then come back and say three mm, okay well why didn't you why didn't you grade it a two you know what made it as important as a three you know why even that and you know the idea is to try and elicit the patient's own Interest. inclinations that will guide them to uh, a more positive outcome but realizing if they don't want to if they shut down and say no 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 to all that the conversation's over and no no finger wagging is going to be helpful but to, generally speaking patients come to their health professional to, to get guidance so i think if it's delivered the material and the message is delivered in the in the right way and the partnership is is established in the right way that a lot of good uh can result from that but in that vein yeah. uh a patient that maybe takes your course and understands how important nutrition is and goes to his or her physician how can they how can they advocate for themselves to get their their practitioner to point them in the right direction is that is there yeah. something that a patient can do um you know on their own you know in terms of their relationship with their healthcare practitioner yeah you know absolutely and generally it um it can happen that way where they're they're reading and then they want some reinforcement from the health professional uh, a more common scenario is that you know they go to see their health professional and and say why wow, your cholesterol is high here's you know your statin prescription and we'll see you in six weeks or two months to recheck um and in that case and and the one you mentioned uh the idea that you know i think it's really important that, that patients are aware and and are proactive about you know fine you know maybe i do need this medicine maybe it would be helpful you know take that at face value but i want to know what i can do as well and and in certain situations the risks are so high that regardless of what's done with the nutritional lifestyle medicine is still been proven in that setting to be helpful uh, say in the case of someone who's had a heart attack uh, i would say that you know a statin and lesser contraindications for most people would be a a, a very very important addition to the program but that doesn't mean even if they're in the statin that that nutrition and lifestyle are still critically important even on the medicine so the idea is that i really advocate for patients to talk to their uh, physician or health professional to say you know whatever you know you know perhaps uh, i i'm i'm i bought into the importance of taking this medicine but i want to know what i can do on my own i want to know what i can do with nutrition i want to know what i can do with lifestyle and you know if i do the you know if i can do those things you know a conversation continues where will i still need this medicine sometimes the answer is yes but even if i still need the medicine will i be better off and the answer is always yes to that question absolutely so now you saying that you update your nutrition course every year because there is so much data on nutrition and you say you're trying to be not but we're trying not to to pick one diet over the other but just look at the studies look at evidence-based medicine to recommend the nutrition that that is best at this how do you sort out all this nutritional uh, information? Because I know we try to do this all the time, and the information keeps on changing. And also, there's a lot of misinformation. misinformation. There's a lot of true information. There's a lot of you know people that are so you know they're so connected to their way of eating. You know, like these you know diets, like a keto diet, or you know. Now there's a lion diet where all you eat is uh, meat and sh and salt. You know, so you know how do you how do you help your patients? You know, you know find their way through all this information that's on the blogosphere. How do you yeah. like do that? <laughs> that is a that's a great question. So I think there's a, a few principles that um, we adhere to when developing the course, and and just that I think is first principles are are really helpful. Is one is to start with 
you know, the, the very best studies that are available. And generally in the field of medicine, uh, many of those studies, uh, early studies are randomized control studies that take place over a long time and look at endpoints that are important with with large groups of people and are studied proactively. And uh, some of the early Mediterranean style diets adhere to that. The DASH diet has evidence in that regard as well. So I think that that's kind of um, some of the foundational evidence. But but there there are others to follow. So I think one rule of thumb that is really important is not to throw your weight behind any one study. You know, sadly, I think the public and health professionals are really swayed by, you know, a very dramatic headline that comes out about a study because, you know, you know, sadly, it, even, you know, even in the, the most prestigious, you know, newspapers and, and uh, publications for the public that it's kind of clickbait to some extent, you know, people, you know, the fact vegetables and fruit are healthy for you is not an exciting headline. That will not be the headline in the New York Times, but it is a fundamental truth. So, so we know whole grains as opposed to refined grains. There's a wealth of information about that. It's not controversial. And with all the different diets, as you described, all the diets that have been advocated with names on them, usually the author of the 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 book that publishes is you know right. the name that's coined with the diet that. Um, that the best of those, the best of those studies agree on many of the common grounds. And what are they? The, that there, there is really no evidence that added uh, sugar is, is not beneficial. Cutting down on added sugar is great for everyone. There's no second principle is that refined grains are definitely a worse choice than, than whole grain. And you're going to argue some people wonder about uh, whole grains. I, I don't believe that's controversial for most people. I think eating more whole grains for most people, uh, unless they have sensitivity. Well, although there are, there, is a, there are some people that feel grains in general are not good for you. And this is yes. a conversation I have with my patients all the time about the quality of the food. And this is one of our you know, messages is the quality of the food and the quality of the grains is super important. Okay. Yes. And I would I would agree with that. And I, I do understand there is a, a group uh, who believe that like gluten is bad for everybody. Um, I do not believe there is evidence to support that at all for everybody. There are certainly people with celiac disease is 1% of the US population. There are people who have sensitivities to gluten, and that is certain to be true. And that is um, a group that's not clearly defined, but might be as high as 10% of the U.S. population. So, you know, there might be 10, 11% of people who, you know, have a good reason to avoid gluten. But for the other vast majority of people, I uh, believe that that adding uh, whole grains to a, a diet would be a, a positive health move. So, in any case, no one advocates for refined grains over whole. And that between the two, there's right. not any question at all. That that added uh, vegetable, that, that as, a, as a U.S. population, we eat far too few vegetables and fruit. No one, no one argues with that either. And the idea that um, that that you can get um, all the protein you need from from plants that is is really healthy, and that for the most part, you know, shifting toward more plant sourced foods and fewer animal sourced foods would be a healthy move for most people. That also, I think, is is well recognized. Around the edges is where the problem are. Like, is it is it best to have a completely plant sourced diet compared to not? And you know, there haven't been randomized control studies to look at that question. So I think it remains a question. Certainly, animal products are not necessary for health by any means. And so, you know, a very healthy choice would be to avoid animal products. But whether or not one needs to exclude them completely and whether that's better than than those who don't you know that where that would be great if there was a randomized control trial but there's not but we do know that there is differences between even in among the animal product world we know that that most fish would be a healthier choice than than red meat so if you're going to if you are going to consume animal products 
best that they be in small amounts for the protection of our planetary health because our our uh, our planet can't sustain the greenhouse gas emissions that are uh, involved with the, the farming or production of, of animal products. So we need, if, if they're going to cons- be consumed, they need to be consumed in much smaller quantities than are generally consumed now. But uh, in any case, fish, you know, would be a better choice than than red meat, but even fish to be consumed uh, maybe once or twice a week uh, in that degree. And so there are differences in the in within animal products, both for personal health and for planetary health. So I think those are general principles, but I think people get caught up that it's got to be completely this way or completely that way. And we know, you know, within the trends that I just mentioned, there are, there are many types of dietary plans based on cultural preferences, based on personal preferences, based on how people perceive their body to function when they eat certain ways, that there are many different ways to eat healthfully. And there are also many, many ways to eat unhealthfully. So we're trying to push people toward, you know, shifting toward healthier patterns of diet without necessarily advocating for it must be this one way. Yeah, this is, well, I'm happy to hear this because this is in line with what we tell our patients more or less. And uh, so I think it's, um, you know, these general concepts are, you know, we spend a lot of time teaching our patients about nutrition and, uh, you know, and I think it's important, as you say, not to be very specific, be very general about what the right general approach is, because I think that's what a lot of patients really need to understand. And I think it's helpful for them, you know, and doctors, you know, I, I see this, uh, you know, physicians, you know, I trained, I finished my training, I was in the 80s, 90s, early 90s, you know, when we trained back then, the health of the physician was not even a concept. <laughs> you, know, it's, uh, you know, the more you stayed awake and the more you tortured right. yourself, the, the better you were, right? <laughs> you, were, you were tough. So burnout, you know, today now after COVID and, uh, you know, we know now there's a lot of burnout and there's a lot of uh, physicians and residents that don't take care of themselves. What What's your recommendations to physicians themselves? Because if we don't, you know, if we're not a good example to our patients, it's going to be hard to communicate, you know, a better lifestyle. Absolutely. That is such an important point. I'm so glad you raised it. And actually, the idea of learning about nutrition to not only enhance patient care, but to improve, you know, the clinician's own health is something that we actually emphasize in this, in our uh, Gables Institute online course, because I, I think that's really foundational. There's far too little attention paid to clinician self-care. And as you said, yeah, you know, the, the toughest, you know, the side of being really uh, 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 a really solid and and uh, all-star physician was, you know, how many hours could you stay up? I was up all night, you know, dealing with this and I'm, I've am i got a full day of clinic. And, you know, instead of discussing yeah, that. Machines. Yeah, like we're machines. And, and, you know, just because you can do it doesn't mean it's not only good for you or even good for your patients. There, there are laws about pilots not being able to do that, but it's interesting that there are no such uh, strict rules about health professionals doing that. And you wouldn't want your pilot to have been up for 20 hours. And I would argue you wouldn't want your physician to be up for 20 hours either, you know, for their care. But then the interesting point, and we also refer to these articles in the online program, is that there's been uh, studies that show that health professionals who themselves adopt healthier lifestyles are much more likely to counsel their patients to do likewise. So this is kind of the, the twofer of health professionals who take care of themselves. Not only do they improve their own health, which they you know are should be committed to doing with an important goal in and of itself but they also are much more likely to counsel their patients and why is it well you know it makes sense that if you have done something if you if you um especially you've seen good results you know you're excited about it and i think patients really also greatly appreciate the extent that that health professionals are willing to share some of their own story like wow, you know, wow! I had an issue with weight too, and I find it really hard. And I'm 
I'm a physician, so I have a lot of stress in my world too, but I did this or that, and this helped me. Maybe not to be prescriptive, uh, like the, the patient has to do the exact same thing, but just to say that, you know, I understand it's a struggle. It's a struggle to do that. And I think that um, when a patient hears from their physician that, you know, wow, you know, I, you know, I make it a point to have uh, like a vegetable with every meal and blah, 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 that I think that means something to patients. It really, um, I think most patients trust and look up to their health professional as, as someone who, who could be a role model. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I get that all the time from my, you know, they know that I'm a preventive cardiologist interested in nutrition and they ask me what I do, you know, and so I have to tell them what I do. And of course. And if you were, if you know, you're, you're doing, uh, you know, everything in a, in a, in a really healthful and, and productive manner, but, but imagine the physician who's not that either they either have to shuffle or, or, uh, you know, kind of give vague answers or so forth, but, but it, it's hard. And I, I actually believe that's one of the reasons that health professionals don't necessarily volunteer a lot of information because they themselves are not practicing that. And, and that, you know, could, could, uh, is, is, is viewed internally as being hypercritical, which, which it is. So I do think a great place to start is with the physician's own health. And, you know, the other, the other part that, that I hear, another point to add to that is a lot of physicians tell me that, you know, wow, I've talked to my patients about, you know, a diet and I've talked to them about lifestyle and, you know, they don't, haven't made any changes. They haven't lost any weight. They haven't done anything. And they say that, you know, patients don't want to change. They don't, they don't want to change. It's pointless. It's useless to even ask them. And, you know, what, what's interesting is there's a lot of data about medication utilization by patients. And there's Medicare data showing that even after a heart attacks, only about half the patients who are prescribed statins are still taking them at the end right, of the yeah, years. I know that. So it's not only lifestyle changes that are hard, it's all changes that are hard. And I think, sadly, it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy for practitioners who feel like their patients can't or don't want to change well, they don't, they don't make an effort to because they feel it's not going to work anyway. So it, it kind of uh, leads to a, a catch-22. You got to break that cycle. I, I do think it's really important, and I point that out in all the talks to health professionals, that any change is challenging, I mean, no matter what, whether well, it's medicine or health or lifestyle. And the small changes are also very, very important, and we cannot dismiss them at all. So when a patient has it, takes down the three sodas to one soda is already a significant change. Absolutely. That's a great change. I mean, zero is the best, but three to one is amazing. And same for meat. If someone's eating, you know, red meat, you know, two or three times a day, you know, I would say that for most people, the best would be zero. But if they go from from two a day to to, you know, one every other day, I say Congratulations. That is a great positive step forward. Now, if you could do more, that's great. But if you just land there, you've made a really positive move. And also, these changes make you happier. You know, like the depression is less, anxiety. Now, this is something I talk to Sandra a lot about. You know, she uses nutrition with her patients. But I think that, and you also have the data about children when they uh, improve their diet, how they're, they're just happier. Well, you know, there's a large study that came from England that when they looked at 9,000 children and they, once they eliminated all the socioeconomic factors and uh, races and uh, what they figure out that the happier, the children that were the happiest were the children that had those five to six servings of fruits and vegetables per day. Yes. And so that, you know, is telling us, and of course we have now a little bit more explanation about that because you're feeding the microbiome and the microbiome right. starts to make us feel happier and math at us. But it's also that the small changes of telling someone, can you take a few minute walk? I had a, a really pleasant experience at the end of my day. I saw my last patient with his mom, a teenage boy that was not really motivated to leave the house and, and uh, stop video games. 
and I end my day and I take a walk at the park with my dog and here it is with his mom taking a walk and I meet them and they say, Dr. Camera, that we do listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that must have been rewarding to see that. And, 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 and was, absolutely, there's a, oh a huge God. need in nutritional psychiatry is, is a really important area. And actually, our nonprofit is, we're, we're just uh, putting uh, some uh, more final touches on a program for young adults that talks about the the uh, implications of, of eating healthfully for uh, mood, for thinking, you know, better and, and being able to do schoolwork better for athletic performance, all the things, you know, young adults are not uh, so concerned about heart disease risk and stroke and diabetes. Although we do know that the early stages of all of those things are beginning in, in childhood, but at least what's on their mind are, you know, their mood, they're thinking, you know, about whether they, they can think clearly and focus and their sports performance, all those things. So we're trying to bring out the information you just mentioned about how there's a clear link between what you eat and how you feel. And that is not always uh, as emphasized as, as clearly as it should. So I, I appreciate you bringing up that point. Yes. And, and uh, now the question I have in the studies that you, that you've had, what about you know, gender, races, age, you know, from young to older. Is there any different recommendations that we have for different, again, gender, races, ages, or not? Or the recommendation remains the same for everybody? Well, you know, there's there's a lot that we don't know that relates to this field of personalized medicine where you know, the, the goal would be that either by virtue of blood tests, by microbiome analysis, or by, by genetic profile, that you'd be able to tailor a diet that is ideally suited to your specific genes and environment and, 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 and in addition to, to preference. Uh, that, those, the, that science is not developed sufficiently to really make very clear um, specific recommendations according to genetics and so forth uh, with very few exceptions. So I would say that, you know, although people based on their culture, based on their taste preference, have individual uh, uh, foods and, and combinations and modes of preparation that are ideally suited for them, that I think in general, the basic the basic principles are are you know important for everyone, including children. You know the idea at a restaurant that there's a children's meal, other than being a smaller version of what the adult meal, seems ridiculous. There shouldn't be a different food for. I mean, not talking about babies and infants, but but beyond uh, for for uh, for for children and and teenagers. There shouldn't be a, a children's meal. That which usually in restaurants and fast food places is, is the junkiest meal of all, you know, it should be a smaller version of the same healthy food, ideally that adults would be eating. So I, I don't believe there's there's um, a general rule we can say that is for one or the other. Certainly, there are certain groups that have lactose intolerance, and so those are groups that you know that that uh, lactose-containing products, dairy products, should be avoided. But, but generally speaking, the principles are the same for all. No one needs added sugar. No one needs refined grains. Uh, everyone could use uh, fruits and vegetables. So there are, there are all of those things, and, and there are barriers, unfortunately. What there are uh, racial and ethnic barriers, sadly, in this country and throughout in terms of access, there's not equal access to healthy food. Uh, either by geography or by economics, uh, and so those are huge. Those are not medical, although they end up being medical issues. They're societal issues that that need to be addressed because they're they're very um, they're very unfair and lead to difficult outcomes. And I think that's something that everyone needs to be aware of. The health professionals, in particular, which we've also we update the courses that I mentioned every year. We added more of the content I'm about to mention in this year's update is that you know sometimes when when a patient uh, is not eating healthfully 
Uh, you know, I, I've heard an example of someone who was discharged for heart failure and they saw them on the street a few hours later, like, you know, eating salty pretzels or something. And, and the health professional said, like, oh, you know, look at what, you know, this is all for now. You know, they're going to come right back. Well, you know, the fact is that people who, who uh, are food insecure, you know, they have no choice but to seek out foods that are, you know, lots of calories at the lowest price possible. So, it may not be their choice. Uh, it may not be what what they prefer to do, but it's what is available to them, sadly, based on societal uh, inequities. So, you know, I think as health professionals too, we've got to have some recognition of of these barriers and not attribute, you know, a patient's poor diet to, you know, lack of interest or willpower, but it may be lack of choices. Yeah, when we recommend the patient you have to eat the fish once or twice a week, the price of fish is incredibly expensive. It's not an easy choice. Chicken is so much cheaper to, to get. So, And then most people really don't know how to cook the fish. Well, how do I prepare it? You're telling me to eat the fish. How do I prepare the fish? So a lot of that is that. And, and then we have the misconceptions that a lot of people have in terms of what to feed a child. That like we're saying, is the recommendation the same for everybody. But a lot of parents, when I ask them, you know, well, I can't take the snack away from my child. That would we, uh, would, they need a snack when they come from home. They need a snack in their lunchbox. And those snacks are all refined Sure, all right, fine. You know, the fact that they claim to need it uh, is is it would be an interesting thing to unpack. You know, where where the sense of uh, of need comes from. You know, and I'm I'm certainly not opposed. I, I've had two children. I I not opposed to you know having foods that are uh, not the healthiest as occasional snacks. You know that that's not an issue. The idea is when those become really. Um, deeply ingrained in the diet in a consistent and frequent way, that's when they're a problem. But a, occasional food of that type seems, you know, yeah. very reasonable to me and part of, of, of uh, you know, just living a varied life, but it, it's the, the amount and the frequency. But I, I would say to the point, you know, your question about fish, well, no one needs to eat fish. So I, I listed that as an example, but for the fish example, there are, there are, um, there are, more economical ways to eat fish, some more economical than others. Some economical ways would be, you know, canned fish, canned salmon, and even, you know, canned tuna. There are, there are types that are um, lower in mercury. The smaller tuna, the skipjack tuna, tends to have lower uh, toxin content. So that would be one. But canned uh, fish is cheaper than, than fresh. And also frozen varieties are typically... Uh, a more reasonably priced than fresh. So that that would be one instance, but you know, there's no requirement that anyone has to eat fish. So it's just one choice that could be had that would be healthier than red meat, that's for sure. Um, but then one one other thing just to to add to economical eating, the one super easy, this is the the freebie, is that if you get rid of of sugar sweetened beverages or artificially sweetened beverages and replace them with water, especially if the tap water hopefully is safe in the community you're in. That is always a budget friendly move, right? You you pay nothing for tap water and you you get rid of the sugar sweetened or artificially sweetened stuff, which costs uh, which costs uh, you know more than zero, and so you save money with much better health. Uh, attrib- attribute. So that's that's uh, should be a given recommendation for everyone if they're willing to to take it. Absolutely. Now I wanted to go back to fish because one of the things that we know is that we do not make omega three, right? That our body cannot make omega three. So when we don't eat fish, which the marine omega three is probably one of the best for our brain for our body. What well, what is your recommendation? Well, there's a, a couple of options. One is, you're right, there are a different omega-3s. The longer chain are the ones, DHA and EPA, they're found in in aquatic uh, from aquatic sources, fish. Uh, and then there's the short chain, which are found in plant sources, uh, like blacks and chia and so forth. 
So the, um, and you're exactly right, they're not biologically the same. And although humans can convert a little bit of the shorter chain, the kind found in plants uh, into the EPA and DHA, most uh, adults are very poor at doing that. Interestingly, pregnant women are much better at that conversion, which is good for the developing child. But it's true. So most people are. So what are what are the possible ideas for people who can't or choose not to eat fish? Is at least to load up on the plant sources of omega three, which are not the same as aquatic, but but they are still beneficial. So one idea is to do that. And the second option, which has not been proven, but to me um, is is a reasonable is a reasonable uh, idea, and that is that there are sources of DHA and EPA that do not come uh, from fish, and they are algal oil. They're, they come from algae. And now, it used to be hard to get them, but you can get supplements. I think that's where the fish get it from. The fish get it yes, from. Yes, that is exactly, we, we talked about that in the course. That is exactly right. Fish do not inherently make this right. fish oil, the DHA and EPA. What they do is filter it from and concentrate it from the algae. So, it's now we've got a way instead of you know siphoning off the scum from a pond you can you can get uh these supplements that uh are the dh it's similar to the story of uh, protein you know animals get their protein from plants so you could just eat the plant you don't need the animal same thing with the omega-3s that the fish ship you know it's, exactly. a, it's the middle the middle the middle man <laughs> the middle creature is right a- absolutely so so there are, are ways to do that and now would be my recommendation at least to uh, more strongly emphasize the the plant sources of omega three, and then consideration could be made toward uh, adding the uh, algal sources of um, omega three, the DHA and EPA. So, as a, as a last comment and question, um, I'm very interested in the whole concept of reversal of disease, and I was the director of the Dean Ornish program for Atlantic Health, and we had a good number of patients come through and we had measurable reversal of disease and that's with nutrition, exercise, lifestyle changes. So what, what's your, you know, as a preventive cardiologist, you know, this is like, I guess one step beyond prevention is when patients have established disease, you know, uh, they think the only option is a stent or bypass surgery or uh, where we can actually get the disease to stabilize or reverse with these kind of, uh, interventions what's your opinion about this yeah you know whether whether it's called disease reversal so for them that sometimes has connotations related to you know looking at angiograms and seeing if the if the plaque is a little smaller or not to me the most important thing that people care about is you know what can i do to reduce the risk of dying and reduce the risk of suffering in a condition that maybe doesn't cause your death, but makes you know, gives you a serious uh, long-term consequences, and we know. So, if you call that reversal, I you know, in 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 physician jargon, that's generally called secondary prevention. You know, a bad thing has happened, like you had a heart attack, or, or you know, whatever you 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 had bypass surgery, whatever something something serious happened relating, in this case, to vascular disease. And the goal would be you don't want that bad thing to happen again. So that's secondary prevention. You want to prevent the second occurrence. And it's very, very clear, including the study I mentioned, the Lyon Mediterranean Diet Study, you know, many years ago, showed a 72% reduction in secondary prevention, reducing a a second event. And that study also showed it up to into the 80s happening. You know, the uh, the patients were getting reversed. So absolutely. So nutrition is good. Nutrition is not only important to prevent the first occurrence, which obviously is the ideal. That's what everyone wants. But for those who have already had a problem, it's integral to the treatment. And that's why I say that uh, it's really unfortunate if after a heart attack or bypass, people, you know, which which I do believe this is indicated, you know, they should be on if appropriate statins and blood pressure meds and antiplatelet, all those things. I'm thinking it's wonderful that modern science has these uh, tools available, which are helpful. But the data is also very clear that if you add a healthy diet to 
that drug treatment, you're going to have a better outcome, a much better outcome than just relying on the medicine alone. And that to me is the ultimate, you know, that's the prevention that is so exciting to me. Well, that's great. Well, thank you, uh, Stephen, very much. This was, uh, you know, a wonderful conversation. And we really, really greatly appreciate your wisdom, you know, all the work you have done and of course, the opportunity to give a, a patient free information and free help, which is nothing, you know, greater than that. That yeah. So we'll be sending a lot of our patients to your institute and also my colleagues. I'm going to encourage my colleagues to take your course. To take the health professional course. That, that would be great. You know, one of the things we talk about is that there's a scaling effect. You know, one physician sees, you know, depending a thousand or 2,000 even patients a year. So think of the, you know, the scaling impact that one health professional could have you know, to, to change population health. So um, that would be great. Well, I, I can say it's been a pleasure speaking with both of you. So I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you so well, much. Hopefully we can do this again soon. Much. Take care, Steve. Thank that you. That would be great. Take care.